So hopefully this will be an interesting uh, look at my life in the open source world because I develop conservation technologies. And I've got about 11 years of experience at ZSL, the Zoological Society of London, which is London Zoo, just down the road. My job has been helping field researchers and scientists solve conservation challenges with technology. And I'm going to take you through a little journey of what that looks like. So this is South Georgia. And you can't really describe what it's like when you're working with tech in this space, because it literally is another planet. But you're looking at about a quarter of a million king penguins. And the device on the left is a little open source time-lapse camera. And its job is to take a photo at set intervals so we can watch the status of that penguin colony. And just for me to look at this photo and get a sense of how long it took to get to an open source device in this space that's supported and adopted by the community was a number of years. And I'm going to go through how that journey took me from being here today, from a from a life where I didn't actually adopt open source. I work with sea turtles. We develop all number of sea turtle tags, that's satellite based, GPS, pressure accelerometer, all the things you'd expect in an IoT world. We work with that same space on animals because we're looking at spatial data, mapping their, um, their movement. And I work in a number of very specialized spaces. This is actually a camera hidden for an anti-poaching operation. So this is looking at um, the loss of rhinos and elephants in southern Africa. But going back to Antarctica, this is what I used to do. So Peli, Peli case on the right over here, this is an Iridium setup. So it sends the data through the Iridium network. And we used to put these little cameras up. And these were prototype boxes. And the reason they were prototype boxes were we just wanted to test the theory. So we went and got some components from RS and Farnell, all the big guys. We built our own little box. Have a little look inside here. And this is what it used to look like. So a huge lead acid battery. You don't want to carry that over a slippy rock, because I tried. Very dangerous. But we needed the power. Um, and inside had a little backup battery. And you can see the Iridium modem. We ha actually had a little um, RF unit there. That's from a, an old company called Sysico. Um, it was called the XRF. And at this point in time, this wasn't open. And this was a problem for me. And I was trying to move into an open space. And this is probably about six, seven years ago. And then this came along. And this is called a Mataki. And it was developed by a chap called Robin Freeman. Um, he's working with Microsoft Research. And it used a little Texas Instrument um, RF. And its job was quite clever, because he was tracking birds. And what he wanted to do was have a tiny little open source device, because he wanted to get the tech into the hands of the birding community. And his objective was that this wouldn't just be a tracker, it could also be a base station. So you could decide what it was going to be. And he did a test with pigeons where a number of pigeons were, t were tracked. And one pin pigeon would turn into a base station during the flight, and all the other pigeons' data would aggregate to that one pigeon. So regardless if two or three never made or two or three went off, if you got one pigeon back at the end, it would have the data from pigeon A, B, C, D, E, etc. And I loved it. It was a, a move into open. I worked within in this space to use it. I adopted it in my tags. But it had a problem. And the problem wasn't about the design, about what it could do from a technical perspective. It was a, because it didn't have facilitation behind it to sustain it. It didn't have a financial incentive to look at who's going to be there looking after the support emails, who's going to be there to fix a firmware bug when it crops up maybe 12 months down the line. And it started to make me think what I could do to help that. And the move for me fundamentally was I wanted to develop faster, so faster development processes. I wanted simple manufacturing and fulfillment. And that long-term support was vital. Because in the conservation space, if you release technology, especially trackers, and then there's an issue down the line, like it's crashing, or there's a firmware bug that prevents you from getting data, and no one's around to look after you in that space, that actual device will be shelved. And people will spend more money going to commercial closed devices because they just need them to work. The actual dependency is a huge issue in conservation technology. So boilies down what I was looking at. Well, the key barriers were development, manufacturing, and support. So then I thought, why don't I actually progressively look at cracking this myself? So I went into the real nitty gritty and looked at what this is. And for me, it, was, it boiled down again to the specialized solutions, the enclosures, the very specific designs required extensive engineering and resources. And that was a continuous problem, the NREs. Also, 
bespoke and expensive. The available solutions on the shelf were bespoke and expensive, but no one was investing their time and effort to say you could take these open tools and get the support you need to manufacture and fabricate. And testing in the field, again, is very time consuming. It's easy to say, here's a device, release it on GitHub and expect people to use it. It takes years for people to go out and prove it's gonna actually work as a viable tool. Manufacturing, this is, a, a, again, a space that the users don't really understand. We understand that if you buy a few components, it's expensive. If you buy 10,000, there's a cheaper cost. And no one was really looking at how we could use on-demand electrical manufacturing and so on, and actually use that as a tool to help people get access to this tech. And the fulfillment and warehousing requirement, we all know that's a problem. It's easy for me, to, again, to put my designs online and say, go use them but who's going to actually care for them? Who's going to warehouse them? Who's going to send it out in the post? This is the big open source story I was trying to crack. And support, we all know, you can get very popular in, in the software world as well. The support out there, if it gets the credibility it needs and if the community takes it upon themselves to look after it, it can be incredibly viable. We all use open source tools every single day. In this space, this was a problem because it needed financial investment at the start to get this going. So I said, my free challenges are going to be this. I want to open source the key hardware components and firmware to reduce the NRE costs, develop an online tool to aggregate all of that demand. There was demand out there. The users wanted to get access to these devices. But we needed somebody to look at the on-demand on manufacturing and aggregate that and do that for them, and then provide a financial reinvestment service. If I'm selling devices and they're open source, but I'm selling them, can I keep some of that money back and do something special with it? Can I pool it and keep it as a resource which is protected and it can be used for the good of the device? And then I met these guys. Has anyone heard of the Shuttleworth Foundation? Yeah. The Shuttleworth Foundation are fantastic. They support openness, full stop. If you go on their website and you look at all of their mission statements and goals, it's all about openness. And I was working with these guys on, again, a sea turtles hack. And I wasn't a fellow at the time, but it, it sh kind of took me into their world and I started thinking about all of the, the slides that I shared with you a moment ago, all of those issues I could fix if I entered, well, if, if I left my day job and the safety net and took a big gamble and joined the foundation. So if you look at what they, they say, we wanted to understand what would happen if the values, processes and licenses of free open source software world were applied to areas outside of software. And that was me. I wasn't just software, I was hardware, I was animal tags, I was wildlife tracking. And I said, my hand up and said, I think, I think that's me. And so I applied and I got a fellowship. And a fellowship is amazing as well because it gives you a good financial grant, $250,000, and they cover your salary, and they give you a support network. They put you in touch with all of the alumni, all the fellows before you who have been down that road They've all absorbed all of the experiences. They can tell you what went wrong. Very similar kind of issues are all exploring. And they get you together twice a year for a week at a location with the whole, the whole group. And you spend days like this presenting your work, really heartfelt stuff about where you are. And it's, it's been a brilliant accelerator. And when I pitched, I said, there are two goals that I want to do with my fellowship. Systematically open source of technologies that offer the most value if they were made open, accessible, and available to all, and develop a sustainable funding model. So, going back to that tag, if you buy a commercial GPS sea turtle tag, today you're going to spend about one and a half to five thousand pounds per tag. That's one turtle, five thousand pounds. Imagine you're a PhD student. You want to tag two turtles, it's probably your entire year's budget. A huge barrier to actually getting the data you need to prove conservation. Um, challenges in the field. And it was very cost prohibitive. If you wanted to tag 20 or more and get a sample size, you couldn't. So we started to build some prototype devices. And this was the first one we ever made. We built it using open source hardware with a company called Irinas in Slovenia, who again was a Shuttleworth fellow. We started releasing all of our um, schematics online as basically all of the reference designs you would need to manufacture it yourself. And then we started taking very well-known tools and building hybrid versions of the tag. So we started making a GPS tag. This is a Raspberry Pi Zero underneath. 
with a custom board which controls it um, as from an RTC. So it's got an RTC in there, it wakes up, it turns it on, we have some management processes, and that's a camera at the front. So you can kind of see where this is going now. We started to think, can we do behavioural studies on the sea turtles? Can we look at if they're ingesting plastic, which is a huge issue now? Can we look at the spatial movement of them? And no one had really done video tags at an affordable price. They're all, again, thousands of pounds. So we took it a step forward. We built a case, and again, all open source. A little wireless charging rig at the front, so you could charge the tags. And here's us in West Africa tagging a green sea turtle with our prototype uh, tag. Little bird's eye shot there. And you can do this yourself. Of course, it's open source. All the designs are online. And this, if this will play, this is always a challenge if it'll actually play. Yeah. This is the footage. So this is a Raspberry Pi Zero on the back of a sea turtle off the coast of South Main Prince Bay Island. And we did this. We went out there and we tagged about eight to ten turtles. And it was a fantastic experience because we'd finally taken a tag which was three, four thousand pounds and built an open source version with very accessible hardware, shared it and said, you can recreate this now yourself. And not just, here's a tag, it's difficult to do, here's a tag, the tools you need in the software is actually accessible. You could watch this, uh, watch this all day. In fact, somebody uh, emailed me saying they have this on their second screen in the office and they have it on loop and they use it as like a therapeutic uh, tool when they get stressed. And it's like sea turtle TV. So, I needed a name for this initiative at this point. Does anyone know what the word Arabada means? Nope. So, Arabada is a ne name given to the Olive Ridley sea turtle when they mass at scale. You may have seen these photos where tens of thousands all nest at the same time on a beach. We stole that concept because in the conservation wildlife world, everybody knows what that means. In the tech world, they don't. So I wanted to kind of coin that term that as a huge community of users, tens of thousands of us, we could do something together. And this is where the service provision and the financial incentive came in. Because it wasn't just me out there developing open source tools. This device, anyone heard of the AudioMoth? You should, you should get one. It's very, very good. The AudioMoth is a low-cost open source acoustic recorder. It's developed by two PhD uh, candidates at Oxford University and a professor, Alex Rogers. And I met Alex in Brisbane, and I went to a conference to talk about the future of conservation technology. And he had the little um, acoustic um, recorder with him. And we were going through the licensing around it, you know, what was he targeting? Was it CERN 1.2? Was it GPL, et cetera, et cetera? But then he said, you know the biggest problem here? When people develop these tools, they want to release it into the community, but they may not have that incentive to start a business around it, to look after it and, and turn it into... Um, a kind of different entity is what they may have originally wanted to do. Because everybody likes to give to the community, but they may not essentially want to run the business side of it. So I said, well, in my fellowship, I'm looking at how I can create these sustainable models and not just support development uh, or develop tools internally, but help the community develop open tools. And so we looked again at the on-demand manufacturing model. We looked at Circuit Hub. So on CircuitHub, you can upload your designs, you can put all your components, you can put your bomb list in, and they will manufacture it and take away the complexity of doing that. So a non-skilled um, user of AudioMoth, someone who just wants to listen for bats in, in Manchester, can go on CircuitHub and say, I want 200 devices. And we used GroupGet, an online aggregator, to take all of that demand, aggregate it, and do all the financial processing. So by talking to all of the community in all the forums, where they had no idea this was even possible to do. Over the gets, the aggregator is going to help you get access to your device. And this is what it was looking like for us. If you wanted to get one audio off, you were looking at $850. That's not cost effective. If you're going to go down to 100 and more, you're down into about $27. That is cost effective. And of course, if you do want to get that one device, you need the community to aggregate the order so everybody gets it for that cost. And that's not really a clever thing. It's been happening for a long time in all these kind of um, online shopping center uh, TV channels where they're like, hey, the more people buy it, the cheaper the cost. But it definitely hasn't been happening in open source conservation technology. So we coined the, the term that we'll do a service model. 
And we had to be clever about this too. We had to make sure that the money that we, we took was protected and it was going to be used for the good of the device, the community, and the people who made it. So we registered a community interest company. And they have, it's a special body in that you have an asset lock. So in the UK, if you're a community interest company, the asset lock prevents you from cashing out, essentially, and saying down the line, I'm going to spin out a different company, I'm done, I'm going to move away, I'll take the funds which we've created and disappear. The funds must be reinvested into the good of the community interest company, so in this case, to sustain these open tools. And we decided to generate a pool of funding through the sale of those devices, in this case, the Audio Moth, and keep, keep that as a pool that can be used by the Open Acoustic Devices team who made the Audio Moth. And if the Open Acoustics team disbands and do move away, things change in their life, that pool of funding is still there. And they can decide and say, we'd like to pass it on to this other software house or this other hardware manufacturer to sustain the device. And importantly, we were doing the fulfillment and distribution. So now when those 500 devices came in, we actually covered the time, like the one, two days for a coordinator, to get the actual import, unpack it, redistribute it, talk to all the users and take away that issue. And it started to make money. In fact, it was making a lot of money. We can't actually manufacture these quick enough. The problem we've got now is the component stock. Like we sold, <laughs> we sold 250 devices in less than an hour. And that, that was like, I got on the train, I went into London, I got off the train and the campaign had sold out. And I was like, this is ridiculous, it's endless emails. You know, I got up 20 minutes later, had a coffee. When's the next round? So it's incredibly popular because the demand is there. It's the first time we've had an incredibly low cost tool, which is as equivalent of a commercial tool. Um, the SM2 out there is the one that everyone uses, about $700. This is $27 and it achieves the same. And of course, this model generates income based on the success of a device, which we had to crack as well. If it didn't generate income based on the success of a device, we'd have a whole hierarchy of devices. And then people calling and saying, oh, I need 10, 5,000 pounds to fix a problem with my device. That wouldn't have worked. But if the device has sold 2,000, um, or if the tool has sold 2,000 um, devices, and the money has been generated from that, then yes, there is a pot of money that you can then use. So it had to be based on the success of a device, not just a pot that would be used to try and help everybody. And it solved this fundamental issue that we found with Mataki. Remember that tag I showed you at the beginning? Mataki didn't have a model behind it. It was a successful tool when it was re released, but it couldn't be sustained. There were too many emails to support, too many users, too many small issues. Everybody's busy, and it just didn't have the drive to become the tool that it, that it wanted to be. And importantly, anyone is free to group buy or build their own device. You can go to Circuit Hub. You don't need the Arabado initiative. You can do it yourself. You can turn it into your own shop, your own entity. And that raised the question a lot of people ask me, what if that happens? What if someone else goes out there and says, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to sell them, and I'm not going to give the money back, which is like a commercial entity. They don't care if it's open, and open source and open use it. We realize that in our, in our niche, the conservation community do like the fact that if they know they're supporting the device, they will be selective in who they buy it from. So in the circle, they'll know that if they go and they make a decision online, and we say buying it from through this initiative will support the actual developers of the device and they will go on and make it better and they will go on and, and keep advancing it, they have a choice. And we've, we found that they will go and buy it through the official channel and that means that you can allow it to, to, be, to be an open tool used by anybody but also generate revenue. So what's next? This is a polar bear in Greenland and it's related to a WWF project. And we've been talking to some of the large conservation organizations out there because they have similar issues. They're looking at human wildlife conflict in this case. And they were looking at, can you put an array of sensors out around this, the rubbish tips to see if they can detect the presence of polar bears? We've been looking at all manner of different sensors. In this case, thermopiles, very cheap infrared sensors. Um, and they were, again, interested in the model because to get an array of sensors at, at cost is expensive unless you go into something where you can say, do you want to release as a solution, as an open solution? We will build an open source tool and share it with everybody in this model, and all the other organizations out there that have similar problems can chip in as well. So you aggregate that demand, you bring the cost down, everyone gets access, and then if anybody works on that due to licensing, we share it forward. 
So if one organization makes a fix or makes it better, they all inherit it, and that's a good thing. So we've been concentrating on this. And the final piece that we only really made about a week ago, it's a, it's a bad photo because I took it on my phone. Um, this is the new open source logger platform. So this is a reference design. It's got everything you would need. So it's got um, a Ublox GPS on there, triaxial accelerometer, temperature, pressure, uh, you program over USB, and it's got a little breakout board here for an open source satellite tag, which is really, really important. Satellite open source is a big thing. And it's 27 pounds, the bomb cost right now. So going back to that world of a, a tag used to cost two, three thousand, four thousand pounds. If the bomb of the components is 27, even if the enclosure is 50, we can then say you can get it for $300. And it will give you a good data set at the cost that people need. So this has been doing its rounds on Twitter. People are excited about it. We're going to release it in a few weeks' time. We're going to go to Cyprus and test this on um, some sea turtles at Exeter University. And this is what it was all about to me, because we can put this online and say, if you want to change this any, in any way now, fine, take off. We'll help you. We'll take off the GPS. We'll run it with just the Bluetooth. It's got Bluetooth 5 as well. And we're going to do the Mataki model with it, where you can do the base station tag synchronization, which Mataki couldn't really ever do long term because it didn't have the model behind it. Now we're going to say we will spend three, four, five, six years making sure this does what it needs. And this, for me, has, has been 11 years of working in the field, looking at how open source can help conservation tech development. And with the support from the Shuttleworth Foundation, it became, it became true. We have a physical board. So if you want to follow this adventure and what, what we're doing, have a look at the um, Arabado Initiative's blog at the moment. We'll soon release a repository where we're going to link through to all our GitHub uh, sources. A lot of the designs are already up already. So you just Google some of the designs. You can have a look at our schematics. And if any of you in the room are interested in this space too, feel free to get involved because it's all purposeful. It all goes through to help, uh, help wildlife. And um, thank you very much. Yeah. What happens if kind of there's this device put out and maybe they don't have the inclination to do the support themselves? Like, do you basically inherit that and do it for them, or is that kind of a, a requirement? Yeah, I think it is an inherited value. So when I went to Oxford to meet the team, there was another um, researcher who showed me a little device he'd he'd made many years before. I was sitting on his desk and it, I think it was a tracker for lions, an acoustic tracker you put on a lion. He was looking for, I think in probably roars, so he could actually see if he could check if a male or female was moving around. But he said, I tried this four years ago. And his approach was he went to the commercial manufacturers saying, would you do the support for me? Because he knew that he didn't have the time to do it. He wanted to go off and make other tags and, other, and work on other projects. And they wouldn't take it in because they said, it's open source. So they said, if we put our investment in here, someone else is going to create this and take it away, and then we won't have any niche. Or if we invest you know, all our NRE and doing all the firmware updates and making it a great tool, because it's under the license, we'll have to share it on to everyone else. And people get worried. And that was a problem to me, because I think that's a great thing. So Alex told me the story. We met, we had a coffee. And I think he specifically linked me up with him, too, so we could have a, have a look at what that meant. So I'd like to even approach him, because he never got a chance to get that out. And if we can prove it, it works well in the field, and people want it, and there's a demand, then we'll say, give it a, give it a go. We'll tell people about it. If we get the first um, round out, the cost is affordable. People like it, and it's a success. You're on your way. And I think the future for us is not just to say, here's a pool of money and have like zero overhead. We'll probably have to say 5%, 10% goes to the coordination and the support team to manage it. But we'll cover everything else. You know, It's, uh, it's like a, it's a service. When I started, this, I thought I'd just develop the tools. The service model has become more and more important because that's what people actually want. And um, I didn't realize how important it would be at the start, but it, it, it became that way. Following on from that question, Alistair, um, how much, because one of the things we asked of the audio mark was really they, they didn't want to put the, because of the effort that would take to get something on the ground. Manufacturing stuff <coughs> does take time and effort. 
Mm -hmm. Um, they offer with the supportive hand, so again, going down to component stock. Circuit Hub are the actual manufacturer of it. So you always have component issues where the component you've picked, your resistor, is out of stock. You have to switch it out. That technical expertise is provided by the AudioMoth team. They'll step in and handle that process because they're actively developing it. They're working on AudioMoth Audio 2.0 right now. It's the... It's for the manual fulfillment, it's for shipping, it's for talking to users. Like we go on the forum for them and we talk to the users about the issues which aren't technical as well, like the questions around the functionality of the device. The AudioMoth team themselves love their device, they're the creators of it, so they get involved too. But if they're busy or they're working on something else, we're there. And you know, you get that sense too. If you go on a forum and you see someone's posted a question and it was posted two months ago and no one's replied, you, maybe you were going to make a decision to use that device. At that point, you go, mm, I'm not going to use this device because I'm not going to get the support I need. So we're incredibly um, aware of that problem. So we try and get on every day. We try and offer that support. And of course, we're covering that cost. We're paying for the human resources to do that. But that's a good thing because we're building this. We haven't gone in from the start and said, you know, here's two million pound investment. It's done. We're building this into something which is sustainable. And we're going to hopefully do what we're doing with the acoustic uh, team with others and then have enough there to say we're off now. We can do this full speed um, based on a successful device. It, it will work. If the device isn't successful, then it will basically wouldn't be supported in the channel. But we'll give everyone a chance. And yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, CERN version 1.2. Um, no, the software was uh, general public, the uh, GPL. Um, for the AudioMoth team, the Arabado initially, when we make hardware, we pick that as our licensing. If somebody else went in and said they had a different take on it, like Mataki had a different licensing, um, I don't think we would fundamentally ask them to change that in any way, but it would have to have an open source value. It would have to be fundamentally open because that's what we want to do as an entity, is to promote that. There's a development path we have to take, which we're mapping at the moment, which is probably like a helping hands period of time, where we say, if you want to submit your device, or if we see, because we're actually looking at the, at the community too, that a device could be successful, we may even invite them to say, would you like us to look at supporting this? If it goes out there and 100 are used, but it's not a success, there's too many problems, then that pool generated by that sale, whatever it is, because it's always, always targeting on low cost, it won't be massive, if it is successful and it, and it can grow, we'll look after it. If it is, then we'll have to say the model only survives based on the success of the tool. And it's open, right? You can pick it up down the line. Maybe the problem is the original developer doesn't have the time to do it. Hopefully, we can at least still say there is a tool out there. It is valid. It achieves this, but it needs some support. We can't give it to you financially. However, if you can get that support, we can still help you look after it. And it is, it is, we're going to have to look at exactly how we fine-tune that, but that's the experiment as well. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Do you need to...